Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, striking up the live stream on a Friday afternoon. It's 4 o'clock Eastern time, and we are talking Boston College football. It is necessary to talk Boston College football. If you took a nap on the Eagles maybe last season, maybe the last couple seasons, certainly after they uh, came out of the gate and showed us the offense uh, early last season that we've grown accustomed to the last few seasons, I get it. But you need to know about A.J. Dillon and even a lot more than just him. He's the headliner, of course. And to do just that, of course, we bring in Dan Rubin from Eagles Unlimited. Dan has an automatic invite to the show. So for not being around, Dan, I blame that all on you. Oh, it's all on, it's always on me. And, and I'm going to blame everything on my wife who isn't here to defend herself. <laughs> because she blames everything on you. But she yeah, wins exactly. in the end. You know that. Yeah, the compromise is the, is the foundation of our relationship. Basically, we compromise and do what she wants. So Dan and I used to get together on a regular basis to kick around the Eagles. And at the time, we, we had right to kick around the Eagles. And Dan, with a little bit more scorn than me, I just uh, did it for fun. Uh, he did it with a scowl on his face. And we talked ACC football across the board uh, uh, on a number of occasions. And uh, the old ACC breakdown show on Wednesday night. So it was a whole lot of fun. So we got to talk BC. And uh, first thing I'm going to ask you, Dan, is are you more excited about this football program and this particular football team than you have been since blank? Hey, I, you could fill in the year. I, I probably want to go back to the Matt Ryan era, to be perfectly frank with you. And, and there is a good reason to be very excited about this team. I know I, I, I was pretty excited last year. I, I, I saw it at the beginning of the year in training camp. And I remember saying that this team was going, the secret was going to be out. And for the, I think the, uh, I think what I had actually said was the time is now for Boston college in 2017, knowing that 2016, they went back to a bowl game 2017, they were going to hit the next step and, and finally seeing everything come to fruition. It, it, it as Steve Adazio said, it would come together and it will be beautiful. And it was, and, I tell you what, the way they hit the ground uh, literally and figuratively through 2017 has made 2018 feel uh, feel like they're, they're, the secret's out. And they're, there's still plenty of room on the bandwagon. There's still plenty of room on the train. And uh, that train might be wearing a number two and running over defenders while, uh, while it's at it. Dan Rubin joining us from uh, Eagles Unlimited. Uh, Dan joining us uh, a number of years now, but it's been a long time since we've had uh, Dan in to talk Boston College in the ACC. And so I've been looking forward to this discussion about the Eagles. Uh, of course, like, comment, subscribe. That's what we do here at Mark Rogers TV. It keeps the proverbial train rolling, as uh, Dan puts it, and uh, drives the search engine. So help me out uh, with, again, likes and comments and subscribe. We've got the live chat fired up with a number of people on board already with a number of comments. So, Dan, you were somewhat close to being as excited this time last year, but did that excitement include the name of AJ Dillon at that point? You know, for, for me, it did, and uh, it I did. think for a lot of, uh, I think for a lot of, a lot of, as I call it, you, you really had to be a hardcore football guy to a uh, hardcore football guy to to expect that that name to have come out. He was a very highly touted recruit. I, I, he had uh, he had an offer, and I believe that he originally thought he was going to go to Michigan. Um, and then decided to come to Boston College uh, for his local guys from Connecticut, decided uh, to come to Massachusetts and come up to, uh, I believe he played his academy or his, his uh, high school ball in Massachusetts and decided to stay home. Um, and Boston College has, has reaped that benefit. And, and we saw last year, the first time I took a look at him on a football field, I said, boy, this kid can be something special. He's 245 pounds. It was a ripped muscle. It was just one of those guys that you that you noticed walking into the room the first time you saw him, and you said, "Boy, I hope I hope he's as good as he looks." And that the hype that I kind of felt about him was going to be paying off. And you know, the first couple of games, you look at a freshman and you say, "All right, we'll see if we can get his feet wet." And and, and he did get his feet wet. He he had his struggles in against teams like Wake Forest and even the Central Michigan game. He didn't he didn't run for a lot of yards. Uh, but then starting that with that Louisville game, he hit that and and it was off to the races. And that is exactly what I felt was going to happen. That's what a lot of people felt was going to happen. It's what the coaching staff felt was going to happen. And he winds up being uh, probably the best running back that the school has had 
or could be the best running back the school has had possibly ever starting off of the small sample. Dan Rubin joining us from uh, Eagles Unlimited, uh, talking to Boston College football. And uh, for most of you that have joined me just here in the last several months or the last year, year and a half, Dan and I used to talk uh, BC and it, the ACC as well on a regular occasion. So it's great to see Dan here. Uh, to your point, Dan, I read here recently that 247 at the time of A.J. Dillon's recruitment listed him as a inside linebacker that was his defensive position so when you convert an inside linebacker not that he wasn't a running back but when you convert that body type to the offensive side and say that's going to be our running back you you know what you're getting and then also as you mentioned you were prepared for aj dylan so i guess dan's calling me out as not a hardcore college <laughs> football fan because i wasn't really aware of aj dylan i think i knew the name maybe we had some conversations way back uh regarding recruiting and maybe uh, I remember them uh, uh, grabbing him away from Michigan, but but at the point, you know, Dan, that the rest of us were sitting around watching whatever college football games we were on that Louisville game day that afternoon, and all of a sudden we're seeing the highlights. First of all, we're we're all surprised because uh, BC is beating Louisville. We shouldn't have really been. Uh, we found that out a couple months later that they were very comparable teams, so we shouldn't have been shocked, but most of us were. Oh, they're beating, beating Louisville. They're scoring 45 points. And then we're looking into the box. And of course, all the highlights are A.J. Dillon, A.J. Dillon, A.J. Dillon, 272 yards. And, and then I'm doing my, my homework and seeing, you know, this guy's carrying the ball five or six times a game. And then all of a sudden we, we give him the ball 39 times. So, wow, it was just, uh, it was crazy. It was a, so funny story that weekend while they were at Louisville, I was actually on a golf course in, uh, in Vermont and I was on the golf course with a guy and, I missed the first part of the game, and and all of a sudden we go back to to watching the game in the clubhouse because it just so happened, like you said, to be the game that was on. I intended later on after it to to tune back in and break it down and and do everything at night that I that I normally do uh, with the games when I either rewatch or, or rewind and, and do all that good stuff. And you know, then I'm going back and and he's saying, wait a second, Boston College is forty something points, and all I did was I looked right across and sure as fire said AJ Dillon went off today, didn't he? And he goes. Who? And I said, A.J. Dillon, wait for them to say the stat. And then they put the stat line up on the TV. And the, the guy I was watching the game with uh, looked at me and he said, you didn't even turn around. I said, I don't have to. He went off 272 yards, four touchdowns, man. That was – it was like – it was it was the payoff that I think having seen him through training camp and having seen him in those first couple of weeks and having seen things start to come together off – maybe what people would have expected in the scoreboard and off a, a couple of performances to see that and say, all right, it's on, it's on. And, and it was, it was off to the races for BC from there. He had another 200 yard performance uh, against UConn at Fenway Park at 190 yards against Syracuse. And you know what? Uh, he's now the, the preseason ACC player of the year. And for some reason, I wish, I, I wish I had, you know, uh, been able to, I wish I'd been able to like go back in time in my DeLorean and, 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 that's what maybe people were thinking. I'd come back from the future uh, in my DeLorean to tell them that. Well, Dan, this not only speaks to your knowledge of AJ, AJ Dillon and BC prospects in the system on the roster. It also speaks to the knowledge of the Louisville defense and their willingness to tackle 244 pounds coming at them. So that, that was part of it as well. I, I believe. But uh, yeah, it's just crazy that if you look at the game log after the Louisville game, that just continued, obviously not at that pace. But if he was running for 125 yards, it was an off week after that. He just pounded everyone in sight. So the team's two and four before the Louisville game and the two wins were over Mac opponents. And then they finish with a streak of games, not just the record and going five and two, five and one in regular season play or yeah, five and one in regular season play, but it's just the ability to stay and play with and beat teams of that caliber. Louisville destroyed Florida State, Wake Forest, you know, really good teams, top 25 to 30 type teams after that. So what else happened? I, I'm I thinking you're going to start with Anthony Brown. Yep, but it, uh, that's that's a good place to start. But I'll actually throw in there that Anthony Brown got hurt and and missed the end of the year after that. He did not play. He was hurt against NC State um, and uh, and missed and missed both UConn, Syracuse, and the bowl game against Iowa. So 
he was around. And actually, he was a big reason why they beat Virginia last year. Uh, a- Anthony was – I mean, I know that A.J. Dillon, the, the week after the 270 yards, he didn't even have 100 yards or a touchdown against Virginia. But you look at what Anthony Brown pulled off in that game, and the fact that against Virginia, he threw for 275 yards and a 75-yard touchdown pass to, uh, to Kobe White. So you started to see him emerge, and then as quick as he emerged, he went down with an injury uh, and handed it back to Darius Wade. But I, it, So I would, I would actually say that the biggest thing that, that, that people saw come together was the offensive line. Um, the offensive line in the first couple of games, BC had dealt with a ton of injuries last year. Uh, John Baker, who was the center, went down in the first game against Northern Illinois, uh, against Wake Forest. A true freshman, Ben Petrula, who had never played center. I, I, I can't stress this enough. He was a guard recruit, a huge kid, had never played center before, is now snapping the ball for the first time. Him and Chris Lindstrom were working during the week and saying, all right, let's let's see how this is going to work. And, and so he comes in against Wake Forest, has a couple of rookie mistakes, starts to get better. They deal with more injuries along the way, linebacking core, stuff like that. But the offensive line came together and plowed the road for A.J. Dillon, protected the quarterback position, gave enough time uh, to to get open for those looks on passes, when on rollouts and whatnot. And it got to the point at the end of the year where BC was actually lining up spare offensive linemen in the backfield. Chris Lindstrom was lining up off-center, off the line as kind of like a fullback, going in motion right to left and providing a block. To which, uh, when I when I actually went and interviewed him about this, I asked him, "Do you ever do you ever hope and pray that maybe they'll that you're, you're lined up in the backfield? Do you ever hope that they'll split you out and give you the ball?" And he said, "Hey, a guy can dream, right?" Uh, but they they had a, a, the offensive linemen, those big daddies, start really blocking, get into a rhythm, and we saw some real old fashioned classic smash mouth Boston College football at its finest by the time that happened at the end of the year. Dan, while the rest of the teams in FBS are charging through the 21st century, you guys are still holding on to 1982. And it's working. It's great. I love it. I'm, I'm a classic football guy. They, you're built on power running, control the clock, def- strong defense, own special teams, win ball position, ball control. You, you hear stuff like that, and you're saying, well, well Syracuse is orange is the new faster. The Big 12 are putting up video game numbers, right? And and I think that that works for them. And I think that there are parts of that game that work very well for them. And I and I wholly support that line of thinking. I'm an old school football guy. I think when you look at the pro style offense or you look at the the spread offense, it, it really gets me going to say, all right, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna grind you down with one of those old fashioned drives. It's gonna take six to seven minutes. We're gonna get it in the end zone, and then by the time we get it in the end zone, your defense is gonna be so gassed. But then we're going to go out, we're going to cause a three and out. You're going to have to punt from deep in your own end. We're going to get the ball back at midfield, and we're going to charge right back up in five minutes and do it all over again. You kill the quarter, you kill the other team's defense in the process, and you control ball position. It's it's like tight and it's like it's like a math equation. It's simple math. You just it just when you can do it, it just works. And I love it. And, and there's a being gassed as a defense because the offense is running a hundred plays and they're running you all all over the field and there's sprinting to do from sideline to sideline against some of the offenses you alluded to. And then there's the we're gassed because this team is just, they're coming at us in waves just with power and underneath their pads. And we've had to take on now two 12 and 14 play drives and we haven't had the ball much and we're down 10 to zip now. And by the fourth quarter, man, we really just we we want no part of this anymore. We we we're done tackling. And to your yeah. point, and to your point, BC actually was going no huddle at times last year too, especially at the beginning with Anthony Brown. Um, we saw it in the in the quick lane bowl with uh, against Maryland at the end of 2016 when they ran something like 85 plays or whatever it was, and there was a there was a time period, especially at the beginning of the year, where BC was averaging some of the most plays per game. They were they were going no huddle. And they were going fast. I mean, it, so they were snapping the ball, but they weren't attempting to. When I say they were going fast, they were they were getting to the line. They were going no huddle. They were preventing substitution on defense, and they were getting the ball off. But it wasn't this. It just didn't feel the same as when you see a five yard quick out, get to the line, snap it in five seconds. Five yard slant, get to the line, and do it in five seconds. 
It was, we're going to run our plays and get into that rhythm. I, I snapped my fingers because that's that's what, what Steve Adazio always likes to say. We're going to get in the rhythm. We're going to run our plays. We are going to go no huddle. And maybe we're going to go no huddle so that we're going to run our plays and, and get down the field as opposed to saying we're going to try to get to the end zone as fast as humanly possible. We're going to run a lot of plays. We're going to run no huddle, but not the same way that everyone else is doing it. I think I said this to you at the time, Dan, that bowl game against Maryland was one of the the most fun uh, defensive games that I've seen, even though there were a lot of points scored. So it was fun from that standpoint as well. It was also fun from a defensive side because I love watching defensive line play that's explosive uh, from the ends, but also pushing the pocket and just making life miserable on a quarterback. And the Maryland quarterbacks just constantly had uh, offensive linemen in their offensive linemen in their lap. And I don't know that I can recall a game where there were more passes batted, deflected, just wreaking havoc in a backfield. So we won't elaborate on that. That was almost two years ago. But that I remember that game as just being fun to watch because I love watching oddities in football. That's something you don't see a lot. Our defensive linemen batting passes all over the place constantly and tackling, you know, there was a safety, I believe, in that game or yep. or something very close to it in which they just did they just swallowed up the back in the backfield in the end zone. I just like love to see disruptive defensive plays. And one of those main guys was Connor Strachan, and you lost him all of last year. So yep. is there hope that he comes back better than yes. ever? Yes, and, and and he will be back this year. And and uh, you know he was out. Uh, I think he missed. Uh, I think he was out after the second game. I think Wake Forest. Yeah, Wake Forest was the last game that he played last year, which was really a bummer because he's a motor guy. Like he's a high energy guy. Um, and I remember when I talked to him at media day last year, we were talking, and I asked him, you know. What's it like when you're in the when you're playing the linebacker position for BC? And he goes, "Oh, this is high energy, a lot of communication. Uh, we're right, you know, you're you're picking up your guy, you're picking up space. You're you got to get to a spot, and you know you're going to get to the spot. It's a competition to get there. And then you make that hit, and you you pancake a guy, and it feels so good. And and then he was going to be the next one last year. When you think about the linebackers who have come through BC, the Stephen Daniels, the Matt Milano's, of more recent memory. Uh, and then it was, and then like a, like a comet, it was like, it was just gone. And, and then he was gone for the year. Um, he comes back medical red shirt. He gets another year. Um, I'd love to see him get back to full strength. I think he will. I think that, that, you know, you, you miss as much time as he did. And with modern medicine being a, a wonderful thing, I think he's going to come back, uh, come back hungry and, and be, and be a, an experienced veteran on what has become an incredibly deep unit. I mean, that, I can't say that enough. That is a deep linebacking unit. He's going to be kind of the uh, the coach on the field, a number one guy for it. Yeah, so he's back. Uh, the defense and these, you know, this harkens back to when we would talk on a regular basis. And, and I don't know that there's anything more frustrating for a football fan. And, and the epitome of this, where the epiphany or the breakout might, we may look back to that Louisville game in which it wasn't just AJ Dillon, but it was Anthony Brown. It was the offense coming together. You mentioned the offensive line as well. That may be the start of something really good at Boston college. We'll see what uh, 2018 uh, holds in store. I think the, the microcosm of that two and a half years of post Andre Williams. And even that offense wasn't anything spectacular. It was basically him just carrying the world on his shoulders for 2,100 yards. But then from 2015, 16 in the first six games of 17 drudgery and that three, nothing wake forest game. I think that was the, that was the, all you had to know about Boston college offensive football for about two and a half years. It was it was tough and and that three nothing and and to an extent I mean that was a and I mean there was a lot of stuff that was in there that Steve Adazio had to deal with too with you know the cupboard trying to rebuild the cupboard of putting guys in that you know that year he went in probably could have used another fifth year quarterback uh, when I go back and revisit that year and in your know, hindsight being twenty twenty four years later uh, three seasons you know four seasons later that you, you went in with a sophomore quarterback, similar to what they're doing now. The difference is that now they have a depth chart of quarterback. And back then, if anything had happened to your starter, you didn't have anybody really who had experience or was ready to play. I, I, and nobody on that team was fully game ready uh, at the time. You dealt with offensive line injuries. You had guys lining up like Chris Lindstrom, right? Uh, he's, he's, a, he's a great case study. 
Chris Lindstrom is an offensive lineman who is a senior. He's six foot four, 310 pounds. When he played as a freshman back in, um, back in 2015, so this being now his fourth season, he was smaller than some of the offensive, the defensive linemen he was lining up against. And you take a quarterback who is just not ready to play and and a guy like Jeff Smith, who wind up becoming an athlete, who was an athlete who became a wide receiver. You're, you're putting them at a distinct disadvantage because you have an offensive lineman who's just going to get run over. He's just ill-equipped to handle the stress of playing in a league like the ACC. And what you hope is that they're going to take their lumps. They're going to take their experience and they're going to grow from it. And a guy like Lindstrom, uh, absolutely did. He's probably one of the best offensive linemen in the ACC, I would contend right now. He's he's a phenomenal offensive lineman. He's versatile. He's speed. He's quickness. He's agility. He's power. And, you know, four years ago, he wasn't. So the offense was kind of playing without a full deck of cards, and then you slowly start to see the cards getting put back into the deck. You, you get a fifth-year quarterback in Patrick Tolls, but you see the offensive line start to come together and the fact that they had a couple of guys who could catch passes. They had a running back. They found out, you know, they had they they got a running back like John Hill that they were able to hand the ball off to. He was back from injury in 2015. He was hurt. And you start to see it come together. And I realize I sound a lot like Steve Adazio when I say this, where it will come together. It took a little while and it took a lot of patience. It took a lot of patience, I think, on everybody, the players and the and the coaches included. And when it did, it was exactly what he'd been preaching for two years. Like it's it's amazing when a coach. I I can't imagine the satisfaction of a coach when he says something and then two years later he's been saying the same thing for two years and then all of a sudden it happens and you're like, yeah, I told you, I told you so. Like you, you can't you can't stand up there and be like, I told you guys it was coming, and it's exactly what happened. And this offensive line's coming back across the board, correct? Yep. yep. the The entire offensive line is back. Uh, it include, including a couple of guys who are actually back uh, from injury last year, too. So I go back to John Baker uh, or Aaron Montero is another one. He's a senior who's back. Aaron Montero, as a freshman, was big. He was just big. Uh, he, he needed to get into game shape. He needed to drop a little bit of pounds, uh, get into get into the proper game shape. Um, and now you're looking at a left tackle who's six foot seven, 320 yards, uh, 320 pounds, you're going to be able to gain 320 yards running behind him. I mean, the guy is the guy is big, and, and so he's back. The, uh, Chris Lindstrom's back. Alec Lindstrom, his brother's on the uh, they have a, is is in the depth chart. And you get a guy like John Baker, who was a was a captain and probably the best center, arguably in the, one of the best centers in the league last year. And he goes down injured, and now he's back. And you've been Petula, who played center last year can go back either to his natural position at guard or play center. And so you've got versatility, you've got depth, you can shuffle these guys in. And that's why people are talking about Boston College as being special. I, I know that I get excited about it. Um, I know that I say, well, this guy might be the best guy in the ACC. This guy might be the best guy in the ACC. And the fact that I can say that, and you might look at me and roll your eyes a little bit, like, oh, he's, he's drinking the Kool-Aid again. But the fact that I can say that, is a testament to the fact that I believe it to be true. 138 career starts. So while you were talking, Dan, I basically went through the Rolodex there in my mind and knowing the Boston College starting lineup for each and every game, even the Holy Cross games and all of them, I counted those up over the last several years. You've got 138 offensive line starts coming back to this this particular team. Um Kobe White. So you alluded to White uh, uh, near the top. Do we have to pronounce it out, or can we just uh, shortcut it as you did? Is Kobe White or Kobe White? I have I have been pronouncing. I know there's a pro, there's a pronunciation guide somewhere. Of course, I call it pronunciation, and I, I clearly have a thick Boston accent, so I can chalk anything up to being what it, whatever it is. I, I I'm just going to butcher it. I, I'll be calling him Hey You before the year's over. <laughs> Yeah, we used to have some great uh, wide receiver conversations, Dan, uh, in the last few years. But you actually have some guys running around out there that uh, you can feel good about because it used to be like, oh, this guy had three catches last year for 18 yards and he had two for nine. And uh, I don't know where your production's coming from, but it starts with uh, White and you've got maybe the most talented roster period that Steve Adazio's had. Yeah, you've got at least three receiving options uh, between Kobe White, Michael Walker, another wide receiver, a guy who 
was a uh, was an all ACC selection as a uh, as a punt returner as a return specialist. Um, he is he's a great returner and he's and he's a wide receiver with a lot of speed. And Tommy Sweeney, who is a fantastic and I mean fantastic tight end. You're looking at a guy who is big, can catch, can can get after it, and and, and has hands, has, has size. And you just want to throw it up and let him go run after it, go for it. I mean, that's the type of guy that you're that you're looking at. And when you're a quarterback and you're staring down those as options, you're saying, okay, we can go take the top off the defense with a guy like Kobe White. We can throw it into the flat with uh, with Tommy Sweeney. We've got other options like Michael Walker. Um, you're, I, I, th- I believe Jeff Smith, uh, uh, if memory is, is still here. Um, he's a receiver with speed who can get downfield. So you're looking at a, 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 an experienced receiving core of guys who, simply put, can can get after it the right way in terms of receiving. You have other guys who we haven't even scratched the surface of yet that, that you maybe see this year, uh, too. So, you know, you're looking at a, a full complement of – there it is, receivers. You have guys like Nolan Bo- Nolan Borgerson, names that, that you haven't heard. You don't know if they're going to come out of out of this at all. Jeff Smith, Michael Walker, Kobe White, all three of them are still there. Plus the tight ends of, of Tommy Sweeney, you're looking at four options. I just needed to to scroll up on my list here, find the uh, find the breakdown. Tommy Sweeney, 36 catches, four touchdowns last year for the BC Eagles, who of course went seven and six. So aside from the one, three and nine aberration, it's been a lot of seven and six for Steve Adazio. And you're excited, Dan. We could see an improved football team that's the best that Steve Adazio has rolled out there in six years, but we could also see the results be similar because I didn't know if you knew this, but uh, one of my off-season projects, of course, is the Mark Rogers TV schedule rankings. Boston College has the 12th. Forget whatever metrics you've seen, Dan. Wipe them away. Mark Rogers TV says that Boston College has the 12th most difficult schedule in the nation out of 70 power five and major independent steam. It's going to be difficult. Oh yeah. We're going to have a lot of fun with this too, this year. Uh, so th- this was the, uh, this was the line that Steve Adazio said, uh, I want to say a week and a half ago. So a week and a half ago, we went down to the, uh, Boston college just built a new, uh, indoor practice facility complex. Media gets a tour. You were uh, waiting on that for quite a long time. Yes. We, we had talked about that. Yes, 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 yes. Um, so we go down there and the last question someone asked was coach, I can't let you get out without, uh, without talking about your team. Uh, you know, we talked about the, the fish, the, the fish field house is what it's called, uh, after the fish family. Um, so they, you know, but we couldn't, couldn't let you get out without one question on the team and, and another media member had asked it. And he said, you know, the line that stuck to me was we tied and we tied, we finished tighter behind seven teams. And I think it actually winds up being that that they were tied or behind seven teams. He said, we play all of them this year. So with the exception, I I went back and I was like, you know what, is he right on this? And I went back and with the exception of Georgia Tech, Boston College finished four and four in the ACC. They are going to play every team with the exception of Georgia Tech that finished four and four last year in the ACC or better than that record. The difference with Georgia Tech is that you don't play Georgia, you don't play the Yellow Jackets, but instead, you get Florida State, who finished behind you. And I don't know that there's a person alive, or, or even, or even maybe in the afterlife, who's sitting here saying Florida State is going to be a seven and five team or a three and five team in conference again. Uh, so you're dealing with, if you want to talk about the difference between being a seven win team and a nine win team, you've got to come up with maybe those. I've been calling it the dirty dozen, the dozen plays that it's going to take to get those two extra wins and not lose a game that you've already won from last year. So excitement is high. Um, and this is why I usually shy away from win and loss holes because you, you look at the difference in it. And I, I normally that's my coach speak t- cop out is what, uh, is what I get called on for it, but it's true. I mean, you got to play some brutal teams in there and the difference between winning and losing those games is going to come down to a dozen plays. Yeah, so here's the deal in the ACC. It's like the SEC. You've got a common opponent, a designated rival in the other division, folks. And so for Boston College, that, of course, is Virginia Tech. That's the obvious rival of Boston College. So, Dan, I have fixed the problem. Nobody seems to be paying much attention to me except for the 
250 people that watch these videos. But besides that, I, I fixed that earlier in the off season. Keep the rivals that matter. I understand Miami and Florida State should be cross-division rivals. Keep that game. Don't want to ever see a year pass by that Florida State and Miami don't play. North Carolina, North Carolina State, keep it. I think that's about it. Some people would say Clemson, Georgia Tech. If you're talking to Ryan Cantor, shaking the Southland, he knows from back in 1912 that Clemson and Georgia Tech are some big rivalry. Fine. If, if somebody knows that somewhere, great. Uh, I don't necessarily know that college football is aware of the Georgia Tech-Clemson rivalry. But anyway, keep those. Fine. Lock those in. But you can rotate the other games, not just one of the two, but two of the two for everyone else. It can be done because what results is exactly what you're talking about. Boston College is playing the two best teams in the other division what we expect to be the two best teams for Virginia Tech and Miami. They went 12 and four in the conference last year. There are other teams in BC's division in the Atlantic who are playing two teams from the coastal division who were like four and 12, five and 11 last year to, to put teams together in one division when they play each other. So there's one of the eight games. And then you've got five of the other seven that are exactly the same. So there's a difference in two opponents out of eight, basically. And to have one team play two teams that went 12 and four last year and another team play two teams that went four and 12 the year, that is a competitive disadvantage or advantage that, that I just can't tolerate. I think it's well, ridiculous. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll play that. I'm going to play devil's advocate on this okay. one for you. And I'm going to, because I've, I've actually done a lot of, done a lot of, and I know you're going to, you're, you might actually kick me off of this for saying this hockey scheduling. <laughs> okay, well, uh, that might, when, I was about to re refute that say nothing you can say, Dan, whatever <laughs> force me to kick you off here. They, uh, a hockey, a hockey commissioner once told me that they, when they schedule everything out, they, they say their exact words were, we can't predict who's going to be good from year in and year out. So they, you know, when they, when they rotate, he said, what, somebody can be very good. And then the next year he said, return everybody who's on the same roster. And the next year, they're you know they lose 75 percent of their games and and that's and that's wholly true so i'm totally fine with the way the schedule lines up um and the other side of it and the second thing is and and i know the acc is a north carolina league so when i say this it is coming from the fact that i know it is a north carolina league rick flair's line to be the man you gotta beat the man in miami and virginia tech clemson they're the man and if you want to get to the top of the acc you got to go through those best teams. And, and I am, it doesn't make the end of your schedule on paper very difficult. I, I think so. I think that's fair. Uh, but if you don't, if you don't want to, if you don't want to take out Virginia Tech, Miami and Clemson and Florida State, and you don't want to head and you don't want to head into those games and say, we're going to be the team that walks in here and beats you. Then I, then I don't know what to vote. That's what I believe in. I would love for that opportunity. I love that opportunity as it is. I love the attitude, Dan. Uh, you got to beat the man to be the man. Yes. But do you have to beat the men? Do you? <laughs> okay. There's Clemson. And then there's, there's a, uh, in, in that division, then there's Florida state. And then there's NC state and Louisville and wake forest. And really the, the entire division now is not bad. There there's not wake forest and Boston college waiting it down. Syracuse. Yes. Maybe to a certain extent, but they're not even atrocious. So the division is loaded. Oh yeah. And yeah, to, to have to beat Clemson and Florida State to get it done and then hold your ground against, uh, you know, maybe you split. Let's say this is a typical year. You you split against Clemson, Florida State. You pull off one of those major wins, and then you beat NC State in Louisville, and, and you you do what you need to do, and you finish 6-2, and two, and you create some kind of havoc of a division tie for a championship, and you beat Clemson head-to-head. -head, therefore, boom, you're in the conference championship game. But, man, when when you have to... So the other teams you're competing against that are climbing that hill as well, or that mountain, Wake Forest and Syracuse, and and the, they have to do the same thing. But when you create that separation of you're playing Virginia Tech and Miami, and I don't know what the schedules are off the top of my head. I'm just making an example. Wake Forest, who is in direct competition with you, is playing Duke and North Carolina. It's just, to me, it's just crazy to have that kind of inequity in the scheduling. Well, uh, 
there was the year that Duke wins nine games, and last year we Boston College had Virginia. I, I that is that is there's that is really the way the way that I feel on it. You, you it gets it gets scheduled out. I don't hold the you know the, the formula to it, and I really do believe that if you that that there's no prediction to to how these teams play or how it comes up, and we could be sitting here at the end of the year looking back and saying. Well, you guys had to play Miami and Virginia Tech, and they could be looking at it the other way and saying the same thing, and saying you got to nine wins because Miami and Virginia Tech fell apart. They, I mean that that's a that's a we could be sitting here saying who knew Florida State was going to was going to struggle last year the way that they did. Sure, there are aberrations, and the the argument you made against it initially is the same one that I receive on a regular basis. Well, you're basing it on last year's results, and we don't know how good these teams are going to be this year. True. I think we have a pretty good idea how good these teams are going to be most seasons. I c- take any conference in America and I can give you the the status of the various programs and tier them. And it's going to hold true for the next five years. Pretty close. All I'm thinking about is that I'm a Patriots fan in the back of my mind. I'm sitting here saying, well, yeah, I'm saying this and the Patriots are going to win 12 games this year running away. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're you have your I could go on and on about this, but it's at its worst or its best, if you want to take on the challenge, it's Miami at Virginia Tech, Clemson at Florida State four consecutive weeks. Bring it on. Let's do it. That's rough. That is rough. But it's it's great. It's great. That being said, since we've kind of made the segue, Dan, how good is the ACC? Oh, this this conference is. I think back at the ACC kickoff, um, I, I called it wide open, or I said after that that it was totally wide open, and that John Swafford had to be sitting in his remarks just just happy as a clam, um, and and really he has to be, and I still and I still maintain that this league is wide open. I mean, this is this is going to be a fun season, and it was a fun season last year too. When you look at some of the games that were played and. That's why we play the games and, and all those the cliches. I they're true to me uh, because you look at the difference in what's even last year with Boston College. We take a look at the schedule last year, right? Finished the season seven and five, but the difference between a seven and five and nine win season is you lost to Notre Dame and Notre Dame ran for a lot of yards, but like I think it was they had something like three hundred yards rushing which the majority of it came on seven plays. You stop some of those seven plays, and all of a sudden it's back to a regular game. It's back to a regular score. The Wake Forest game, you don't make one of those mistakes. You're winning that game. NC State, I believe you probably should, and Virginia Tech were games that I think BC left points on the table and probably could have come and won those games. So Clemson even, you're, you're hanging with Clemson until the end of the game, and then you sustain an injury in the linebacking core, and Clemson breaks it open in the fourth quarter. So – when you're looking at the ACC and it goes in reverse too, when you think about if Clemson, uh, you know, Miami against Pittsburgh doesn't make a couple of those mistakes, they're they're undefeated. The ACC's got two teams in the in the college football playoff uh, after the ACC championship game. So I think when you look at the league and you look at the difference in these teams, the difference is going to come down for for some of these teams to a dozen plays. That is really going to be the measure. Can you make the stop when you look back on your season and say? We won this game because we made the stop when we had to, and it could be an innocuous play in the second quarter when you don't think of it, that that is the play that comes back to impact you. And from start to finish, no matter who you're playing in the ACC, this league is going to give you fits and starts, and that is what makes this league so much fun to watch. Dan, I just looked up the box score to that Notre Dame game last year because I remembered that being just – uh, it was it was it was pain. It was painful because you knew the three hundred yards on seven carries. Uh, I knew it was a crushing loss, and that um, it, it was actually close for about two and a half quarters, right? I think it was somewhere in the third quarter that it got away from you. But I knew that yep. Notre Dame just ran it down your throats, five hundred and fifteen yards rushing. Yep. I think that was a record. It, I think that was a record, and that was. A, and if you look at the rest of the defense, the rest of the year, that became an aberration, and you're sitting there saying, "Well." Can we get some of those runs back? And you're just like, hey, you 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 take it as something that happened. You correct it, and you and you keep plowing forward. But you, you in order to become the nine win team, you prevent that from from happening. And I think that's a uh, 
that's a fair assessment. I, I, I think Steve Adazio would probably say the same thing that in order, in order to be where Boston College wants to be and where a lot of people would now expect them to be, you make the jump and you make those stops, or you make at least a few of them um, if you get into one of those situations like and you're facing a team that's that's starting to have some success against you. It's Boston College Football Talk here with uh, Dan Rubin from Eagles Unlimited right here at Mark Rogers TV. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Even if you don't agree with me, you got to agree that we deliver uh, the most insightful college football discussion, debate, and analysis with the best bloggers, broadcasters, writers in the nation. Sometimes you've got to put up with analysis from me uh, as well. And uh, yeah, the BC story is an interesting one. Brutal schedule, but they counter it with maybe the best running back in the country. Uh, freshman now turned a sophomore starting quarterback who's exciting, the best wide receiver and receiver core, including the tight end that they've had in years, an offensive line that is stacked with, as uh, Dan mentions, a first team at the all ACC position at center and a couple third teamers and 138 starts and always a rock solid defense with one of their best playmakers from two years ago, Connor Strachan with 11 tackles for loss and 80 total tackles two years ago coming back a very good football team with a tough, tough schedule and task at hand. Uh, Dan, we appreciate the time. It's great to have you uh, and great to see you. And uh, if we have any news from camp in the next few weeks, maybe we can have you back and uh, preview the season. I'm looking forward to, uh, to, I'm looking forward to getting out into that, into that uh, field house and seeing the practice or seeing some practice, seeing some scrimmages and uh, Hey, football's back. Isn't it a beautiful thing? Football's back. This is what, this is what we live for. And it's a beautiful thing, yes. And as you're probably sitting in whatever the heat index is with the humidity at this point, I know you love that because it's soon going to be 50 degrees outside. Me, I love to hold on to the summer. Can we have some football the first couple of weeks of September? That's great. It's still 85 degrees, but still have football and sun and warmth. But for you, I know you're a hockey guy. Yeah, g give me give three me, five degrees. Give me that, that Thanksgiving weekend. Give me that Syracuse game. That Syracuse game is going to be nice and chilly. I'd like to remind everyone that uh, if you want to be on the Mark Rogers TV mailing list, uh, we're starting this the first week of football season. Please bring me your email. I will do nothing with it aside from deliver uh, specialized uh, mailings to you with special content each and every week, starting with the first week of the football season. So please do that to Mark Rogers TV at Gmail, Mark Rogers TV at Gmail. Send it right there. And uh, we'll do that. And uh, I will not bother you with a bunch of junk email. It will be one per week. Uh, Dan, we appreciate you jumping on board. Uh, this thing hopefully will explode throughout football season here as we get uh, more subscribers, likes, and comments uh, uh, and, and bring on the, the best guests we can find like uh, Dan Rubin here. Dan, you have a great weekend. Hopefully the wife gets back in town here soon. Hey, hope so. They, uh, the storm's coming up the East Coast, and I know that you talk about humidity. She's in Florida. It is blasting its way outside, and uh, I can see my internet even losing power, losing steam as we talk. So if anybody else can hear me out there, Claire Crawford's coming up at 6.30 Eastern to talk Ohio State football as well. And, of course, uh, I think there's something concerning Urban Meyer that uh, we're going to address, but I'm not positive. I'll have to look into that. All right, Dan, you have a good one. And we'll see everybody else at 630 Eastern with Claire Crawford on Ohio State. Thanks, Mark.